Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the NANR Director's Lecture. We are pleased to have you here today. Um, and also, we uh, welcome uh, those of you who are listening in uh, off-site, uh, just uh, to let you know that this presentation will be videotaped today, and it also will be archived, so that if there's someone that you want to recommend it to, then they can listen to Kate at their convenience uh, if they're not here today. So we do bring together, um, we do meet uh, four times a year for a director's lecture, and in doing so, bring together some of our leading scientists from across the country and across the globe. <clears throat> and we, as you know, are responsible for providing the evidence base for the largest uh, portion of the healthcare workforce, the 3.6 million nurses across the country and across the globe. Um, and we also focus on self-management, uh, wellness, uh, end of life, and symptom science. Now today we're focusing on the self-management portion of our research that we support around the country and around the globe. We are really excited to have Kate Lorig with us today. Kate is someone who has been a real pioneer in this area and in fact, quite frankly, has done the seminal work uh, in self-management along with uh, uh, one or two other pioneers who have really started thinking ahead. As you know, <clears throat> as we all know, because, largely because of the advances in, in science, people are living longer now. Um, but they're living long enough to uh, develop chronic illnesses that we haven't seen before. And so it's estimated that um, each individual over the age of about 45 uh, lives with one or more chronic illnesses. So, so the idea that people uh, are developing the chronic illnesses, but they're also much more uh, knowledgeable about healthcare, much more information is available. And even though they may be experiencing chronic illness, they're much healthier than their counterparts in previous generations. So people, um, it's important that they be able to, uh, that we be able to respond to their preferences to um, handle their own care, handle their own lifestyles, and to be able to live as normal and active a lifestyle as possible. So we are extremely enthusiastic about the concept of self-management and fund a fair amount of research around the country and around the globe. Having said that, one of our very early grantees uh, in this area has been Kay Lorick. She is uh, renowned internationally for her research on self-management and also her health education programs, which grow out of her research programs. Um, she also is unique in that she not only tests these programs, but she goes on to disseminate them so that so much of her work has been incorporated into policies and by either the organizations uh, who advocate, patient advocacy organizations, or, or on a national scale. So not only is her work important but uh, in, in itself, but it's important because of the applications that she has been able um, to uh, affect. Now, she also, um, I would say that her, the um, enhanced quality of life and outcomes for a variety of populations, including our underserved populations, um, include uh, individuals living um, with uh, arthritis, cancer, um, diabetes, depression, and pain, which of course we know is important across the board. Um, now, she is also the director uh, of the Stanford Chronic Disease Self-Management Program. Uh, she founded and, and directs that. Um, and she is a major collaborator, uh, not surprisingly, on the West Coast, the, the major player um, out there, Kaiser Permanente, as well as the vet U.S. Uh, Veterans Health Administration um, in establishing expert patient programs um, for, um, and one of those, in fact, uh, she has established in the United Kingdom to affect and improve patient uh, education in that area. Um, she um, has her doctorate in uh, public health uh, from UC University of California. She also has her um, uh, master's degree in nursing and a Bachelor of Science uh, in nursing as well. So, so we're really pleased to claim her for all of her areas of expertise and have benefited greatly um, as a, an institute and also as a profession from her collective expertise. Um, now, I won't go through all of her awards uh, for you, but, but simply to say that they are many and they're notable. Um, now, over her career, she has published a number of papers in these areas, and also she has written um, several books. She has also translated her programs into Spanish and has um, 
really um, establish herself as an expert uh, in these areas. So when you think about self-management, the first name that often comes, almost most often comes to mind, is that of Dr. Kate Lorig. Um, so we're really pleased um, to have her with us. Um, we, we understand that part of, the, part of her motivation um, uh, in this area was from her early days in the Peace Corps. And so we, we feel that that's uh, pretty interesting. We uh, can see that, uh, that uh, peering through some of her work. Um, she also currently serves on a PCORI um, advisory uh, council. Uh, she's a member on the advisory council for rare diseases. So you can see her expertise is broad. Um, so we look forward to hearing from her this morning and um, getting the information about the latest things she's doing as well as her program overview. So Kate, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you so very, very much. I'm delighted to be here, obviously. And I was thinking as I was sitting there of the important nurses in my background, and you really don't want me to hear about all 85 of them. But I would like to mention somebody that most of you have never heard of, Marianne Garrigan. Marianne Garrigan was Associate Dean at Boston University when I was an undergraduate. And she is really the one that is responsible for my being here today. For those of you that know me, I was not the easiest of undergraduate students. In fact, I was a very difficult undergraduate student. And if Marianne had not protected me and saw to it that I gra was graduated, I would not be here today. I can remember the day she said to me, Kate, you're right. But if you insist on doing that, you will not graduate. So just be nice and do what they tell you to do. <laughs> Good advice sometimes. And so I think that Marianne, should she be alive today, would be very, very pleased to see that her efforts, did I just lose the mic? No? Would be very, very pleased to know that her efforts had come to something fruitful. She, by the way, was one of the great early historians of nursing history. So let's talk a little bit about chronic disease self-management. I'm going to do a little science, I'm going to do a little storytelling, and um, we'll see where it goes. And then at the end, we'll have plenty of time for questions and you can ask anything you want. So I've been really, really fortunate over my career to get funding from lots and lots and lots of different places. And for those of you that are young or thinking about a research career, one of my pieces of advice to you is there are lots of places to go for funding, and they're each important for a very different reason. And I'm going to give you an example of that. You see Archstone Foundation, which none of you have ever heard of. Archstone Foundation funds programs for older people in the state of California, mostly only in the state of California. At one time in my career, there was an NIH grant that said, well, this is a very nice grant, but we're not going to pay to develop the intervention. Uh, if you can get the intervention developed, then you can come back to us and we'll talk to you, which was really a very nice way of saying, go away, little girl, and don't bother us. <laughs> I went to Archstone. Archstone paid for the intervention development. We went back, and the result of that is we now have our internet programs. So sometimes this whole broad range of funders is really, really important. Let's talk a little bit about what self-management is and what it isn't. This is a term that gets bandied around a lot. I actually don't know if NINR has an official definition or not. But this is the definition that I happen to like best. It's, an, it's a definition from the Institutes of Medicine from a report done in 2004. Self-management are the tasks that individuals must undertake to live with one or more chronic conditions. They include having the confidence to deal with the medical management, role management, and emotional management of their conditions. Let's talk about that definition for a minute because it actually forms the framework for everything that I do and I think for the whole background of our science. Confidence. For me, confidence means self-efficacy. Uh, Self-efficacy is the theory that I've worked with my entire research career, well, almost my entire research career. 
story, especially a story for those of you that don't know what the role of theory is in all this stuff. I didn't either. I was probably the only student that ever went through the doctoral program at UC Berkeley that did not have a theory base to my dissertation because I didn't understand what theory was. And we got within about two months, my data was all collected, all this stuff was done, and my department told me that I was not going to have the first dissertation that didn't have a theory in it, and they didn't care what I did, but I better put a theory chapter. So I wrote a theory chapter. Don't any of you read it. It makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> um, but there is a theory chapter. So I was not enmeshed with theory until early in my career, in, actually in my dissertation, we had a hypothesis that changes of behavior would be associated with changes in outcome. Pretty simple hypothesis. Well, we got changes in behavior. We got changes in outcome, both were positive, and there were no association. The greatest association we ever had was about a 0.14. This was a mystery. And thankfully, I had good mentors that said, well, we got to solve this mystery. And I worked with terrific statisticians. We spent a couple of years wandering around looking for what happened. We looked at a lot of theories. We looked at stress and coping. We learned, looked at learned helplessness. We looked at coherence theory. None of them was, were very explanatory. One night, one of my physician mentors went off to a university party, came back the next day and said, I met somebody last night at this party and I was talking about what we were doing and he said maybe he could help us and that we should come around and see him. And I said, oh, who did you meet? So the guy kind of pulled in his pocket and he said, oh, here's his card. Um, have you ever heard of a guy by the name of Albert Bandura? <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> But it never occurred to me three years into my career at Stanford that he was on the same campus. So that started what has been a long friendship. And after meeting with Dr. Bandura, it was very obvious very quickly that I knew nothing about psychology, but he really liked what I was doing. And so he was kind enough to give me one of his doctoral students, Ann O'Leary, who I believe is now at CDC. And Anne did our first study looking at the associations between self-efficacy self and both behaviors and outcomes. What we found was that both baseline self-efficacy and changes in self-efficacy predicted outcomes in our self-management programs. That piece of research has been replicated now many, many, many times. Um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done with that. But finally, about three or four years into my career, I had a theory, and I've stuck with it. Um, I still think it's a pretty powerful theory, and I think there's some things around it that we could work with, and we can talk about that if you'd like. But don't give up if you don't have your theory quite yet. Sometimes they come later. So that's the confidence part. Now, the medical management, role management, and emotional management part comes from Julie Corbin and Anselm Strauss. Julie Corbin as a doctoral student in nursing at UC San Francisco and Anselm Strauss, a sociologist, wrote a lovely book, The Never-Ending Work of Chronic Illness, one of the very first groundbreaking um, grounded theory studies in which they interviewed lots and lots of people with chronic illness and found that there were three things that they had to deal with, medical management, taking your pills, et cetera, role management, doing the things they wanted to do, and finally, emotional management, um, dealing with the frustration, fear, depression of their conditions. Most programs in patient education only deal with medical management. And it was reading the work of Corbin and Strauss that got me thinking about the fact that we really needed to expand this field to think about the work of chronic illness. So that's the definition I use. You might wonder why the Aboriginal painting. The Aboriginal painting is because we actually have an Aboriginal edition of the self-management program. It's being given through South and Central Australia. 
And when they first did their manual, they commissioned artwork on self-management. And this particular, and I actually have copies of all the artwork. If anybody ever wants to see them, there's a series of six or eight of these paintings. This one is people looking after themselves and each other. And so this is a very specific piece of artwork about self-management. And so why should we care? Why should we as health professionals care about this whole thing? We should care because people with no chronic conditions live 99% of their time outside of the healthcare system. And what they do in that time largely determines their quality of life, their health, and their utilization of the system. But we don't have anything systematized within our healthcare system to help them live the 99% of the time they're outside of the system. So that's why I think we as health professionals should care because we're not maximizing our healthcare systems if we don't include self-management. Then you wanna talk about why do patients care? Well, this is a photo of Renoir in his older years. Renoir had very severe rheumatoid arthritis. If you look closely at his hands, I wish I had a close-up of his hands, and I don't. But even in this photo, if you look at closely at his hands, you can see that they're very typical rheumatoid arthritis hands, especially hands before we had the biologics that we have today. And what happens, of course, is when people have a chronic illness, there not only does their health change, but everything else in their lives change. And I'd like to show you an example. This was Renoir at the height of his ability as an artist. And this is Renoir near the end of his life. He was still painting. He was still painting with brushes strapped between his fingers. But as you can see in this painting, while well, it's certainly a nice painting, it does not have the quality that this has. He was able to manage keeping doing the things he wanted and loved to do, maybe not quite as well as he did at the height of his profession. So now let me tell you a little bit about the story of the chronic disease self-management. That's over the last 30, 40 years, we've done a huge number of studies and we've done it around all kinds of different diseases in preparing today I realized I could only tell one story, and that was of the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program, so that's the one I'm going to tell. Now, this story started because I started working in the field of arthritis, and after about 10 years of working in arthritis and kind of working out some of the theory base, our patients were saying to us, you know, what you're telling me is really, really good, but what my cardiologist or my pulmonologist or whatever is telling me is something else, and I'm really confused. And as we started looking at the data, it was very clear that people don't have one chronic illness. They have two, three, four chronic illnesses. So we had this crazy idea that maybe we could put them all together in one program at one time, that a program didn't have to be disease specific. And it was crazy enough that we had a really, really hard time getting it funded. Um, at that point, when, we finally, when it was finally funded, um, it was funded through AHCPR, which has now become ARC, and through California Tobacco-Related Disease Research Funds. And the objective of that first study was to evaluate the effectiveness in changes in behavior, health status, and health service utilization of self-management programs for chronic disease designed for use with a heterogeneous group of chronic disease patients. Well, while we wanted to have all takers, it was pretty obvious that we were never going to get that funded because people just didn't believe in that. And since the tobacco fund said that they had to be tobacco-related diseases, in this early study, people had heart disease, lung disease, stroke, and they gave us arthritis because we had worked with arthritis before, which was very nice because that way we got all the other diseases. So this was the original study, but 
as we started looking at what we wanted to look at as outcomes, we could not find the instruments that we wanted to find. And so that meant that we had to take a detour and we actually spent the first year, year and a half doing instrument development. We did that by having 22 focus groups with patients, asking them what their problems were, then developing instruments around those problems. During that time, I was very fortunate in having Anita Stewart work with me. Dr. Stewart is a psychometrician um, that probably is best known for the SF36. I know that you all think John Ware wrote the SF36. Well, in fact, he did. But the person that did most of the work on that was Anita Stewart. And so, because I don't know much about instrument development. And so we developed all these questions and all these instruments and did psychometric <coughs> testing, including sensitivity change. We translated them all to Spanish. That actually came a little bit later. And we ended up with all these instruments. So this made possible the study, but we actually had to develop these things. Now, the nice thing about these instruments uh, is that we developed them. Uh, we wrote a book giving all the instruments. We've written several articles over the year. But the most important thing is the instruments are now available on our websites that receive about 10,000 yearly views. And they're free for anybody that wants them. Uh, this is the website, uh, patienteducation.stanford.edu. You can just go to research tools, and you will see that all the tools were there. And there's a little story about this, too. Because a little bit later, we had a pro project funded by um, the National Institute of Nursing. And at the end of that project, something very unusual happened. We had some extra money. Now, I don't know what would happen today, but I was foolish enough to call the program officer and say, would you like your money back? <laughs> and she said, no. Actually, she was stronger than that. She basically called me a fool. Uh, she said, find something useful to do with it. So what we found useful to do with is to create this website and make it available for everybody. So all of these instruments sit on that website. All of their psychometric properties sit on that website. All of their coding sits on that website. And any other publications we've ever done sits on that website. And you don't have to ask permission to use them. So I just show you that because I think it's a pretty decent resource for folks. And you all are responsible for it. So what was the intervention? We finally got the instruments all done. And we had to develop an intervention. The intervention that we developed is a face-to-face, in-person intervention, six weeks, two and a half hours a week, eight to 15 participants, two peer leaders. And this ends up being very, very important for translation. I think if we had had professional leaders, we would not have been able to translate. But our leaders have always been peers, so it's people with chronic illness teaching people with chronic illness. The programs are exceedingly interactive, and they're based on self-efficacy theory. And what does that mean? It means that we know that we can change somebody's self-efficacy in four ways. One, skills mastery. So in our program, every week, people make an action plan, they report on it the next week, and over six weeks, people gain skills mastery in the areas of things they want to do. Secondly, modeling. Seeing people like themselves as leaders and as helping other people. Our leaders are not only peers, they're peers in the community they serve. When we give a program on the Stanford campus, our peers are retired Stanford staff or even Stanford professors. When we give a program for the Native American Health Center in San Jose, 15 miles away, the peers are, Native are urban Native Americans living in that community. So we take this whole issue of being a peer very, very seriously. Uh, 
The third way of enhancing self-efficacy is reinterpreting meaning. So if people think that they're tired or fatigued all the time because of a disease, then they're not going to do anything. But when they start thinking that fatigue might come from depression, poor nutrition, lack of exercise, stress, this opens the possibility for them to try different things to deal with fatigue. So every time we talk about a symptom, we talk about it as having multiple causation and multiple things in self-management that people can do. And finally, persuasion, the fourth way of enhancing efficacy. That's why I love groups. Groups are very, very persuasive. People helping each other, people sharing. I will always uh, go for groups as opposed to one-on-one. -on -one. Participants are adults with any long-term medical, physical or mental health condition. Now I said in the original study it was limited, but today we've done studies with the severely mentally ill, uh, with all kinds of folks. Uh, there's actually some people in New York right now that are doing a program for the developmentally disabled. And so we'll put anybody together in the same group. And what this does, and especially for the mentally ill, what this does is it destigmatizes their illness. They have an illness just like everybody else, not a stigmatized illness. My guess is that we will never revamp our HIV program because since we started that program 20 years ago, HIV has moved from a very stigmatized death sentence to a chronic illness. So my guess is in the future that that program will be retired and that we will move the HIV people into the chronic disease program as well. So what are the outcomes? Well, in this initial study, um, and by the way, I, I thought I put an N on here, but I guess I didn't. I think it's about 700 people, uh, 62 years of age, 27% male, 14 years of education, which is absolutely the norm for the San Francisco Bay Area. And they had their 2.2 chronic diseases, which also fit the national norm. So we were pretty well dealing with people uh, in the population. The picture is just a photo of what a typical group would look like. Not very imposing. At six months, we saw improvements in self-rated health. Self-rated health is an interesting measure because you just ask people, how healthy are you? And they say, excellent, good, fair, poor. I think there's another category, I'm not sure. That happens to be the single best predictor we have of future health. It's better than cholesterol, it's better than weight. And there's a number of studies that have shown that. Um, this question comes actually from the National Health Survey. We looked at disability, role function. Remember, people, role function was one of the key pieces of self-management. So if we were going to do anything with self-management, we had to change role function. Uh, we improved energy, uh, lessened fatigue, the single most common symptom across chronic illnesses. At that point, we did not have a good depression scale. It was before the PHQ-8, and we already knew that the CESD was probably not sensitive enough in the subclinical range. So we used a distress with health state, but I would call that depression. Uh, and since that time, we've done a lot of studies with the PHQ-8, and we consistently changed depression. And finally, we had fewer days of hospitalization. That last piece of data is probably the most important piece of data that we have ever had. Because what it did is it led the way to policy. I can promise you that nobody in health policy is interested in the fact that we enhance self-efficacy. Sorry, but that's the way it is. They're very interested in the fact that we reduced utilization. Let me just talk back about that study a little bit more. We actually followed these people in a longitudinal study out for two years, and we found out that they actually maintained these outcomes for up to two years. That's an interesting finding because everybody believes that you've got to reinforce this stuff. 
We've now done three reinforcement studies where after the initial program, we've randomized to a reinforcement or no reinforcement and looked at them a year later or 18 months later or two years later. It never makes one whit of difference. That what happens is both groups tend to maintain their improvements over the long-term time. And time after time again, we see increased improvements between six months and one year. Why is that? Because I think if you're really doing self-management, it becomes internalized. You're doing it for yourself, you're not doing it for somebody else. Uh, just the way all of you brushed your teeth this morning, and nobody's probably told you to brush your teeth for many, many years. It becomes self-reinforcing. So we finished the initial study, and so then we said, well, let's do the whole thing in Spanish. Let's do it all over again. Uh, NINR was kind enough to fund us for this study. And these study participants were very different. 7.5 years of education, three or less years of education, about a quarter of them. Um, very, very different group. This program was written in Spanish. I will tell you I had a great deal of problems with NINR because I would write this, I would write and say, we're going to write the program in Spanish. And I would get twice, I get things back from reviewers saying, please tell us how you are going to translate your program. And I would write back, and in 18 places in the proposal, I would say, this program is going to be written in Spanish. And they would write back, please tell us how you're going to translate this program. And finally, a very wise program officer said to me, Kate, just tell them that should you ever want to use the program in English, you will use back translation. Because that's what they really want to know is, did I know about back translation? So I put that down and got funded. <laughs> uh, but you know, that, those things happen. So in this study, uh, this gives you an idea of who was in the study a little bit more mixed group. Notice that 45% of those folks had diabetes. And at this point, that, this was a one-year randomized study. They had better self-rated health. I think it was a one-year randomized study. I'm not sure actually whether these are longitudinal or randomized results now as I tell you this. But at any rate, they had better self-rated health, less health distress, basically the exact same thing we saw in our English speakers. What's really interesting is that our results have always been stronger in our Spanish speakers than our English speakers. <coughs> and we had fewer emergency room visits and greater self-efficacy. So again, we were seeing utilization changes, a little bit different types of utilization changes, but utilization changes nevertheless. So then, Let's jump forward 20 years or so, and it's now the early days of the Obama administration, and we had the Recovery Act, and the Recovery Act wanted shovel-ready projects. So the Recovery Act ended up giving money to the Administration for Community Living, which at that time was called the Administration on Aging, to disseminate this program in as many states as wanted to apply for it, and to do an evaluation. And this was a longitudinal evaluation. In the meantime, we had had 50 or more studies about the program, and the program had actually been fairly widely disseminated, but the Recovery Act made a huge difference. So, I was very fortunate in working with Marsha Ori at Texas A&M and also Nancy Whitelaw at the National, uh, National Council for Aging. We were able to do a national one-year longitudinal study. We had 22 study sites, over 1,000 people. We did this study in both English and Spanish. And the underrepresented were overrepresented. About 45% of our subjects came from underrepresented populations. In looking at an evaluation plan, we turned 
to Berwick and his triple aims of health care, better care, better outcomes, lower health care costs. By this time, we were thinking much more strategically about policy and policy implications. And what we found under better care is that people were communicating better with their physicians, their medication compliance was improved, and their health literacy was improved. Marcia Ori insisted that we put in a measure of health literacy. I told her I didn't like it because I didn't know what health literacy was. She insisted she was right. Better outcomes. People had better self access to, uh, better self-assessed health, improved depression, better quality of life, less unhealthy physical days, less unhealthy mental health days. Those questions, the last two, oh, actually I think the last three all come from the National Health Survey. And finally, we saw reductions in um, emergency room use not much change in ER, a little bit, but not much. Um, n nothing in hospitalizations, a little bit, especially in the first six months in days of hospitalization. After this, the tech people at Texas A&M did a cost-effectiveness study with the data and basically concluded that there was about $400 savings between three and four hundred dollars savings per individual from the utilization. The intervention itself cost between three and four hundred dollars. Uh, the reduction in utilization was about seven hundred dollars. And so the program was shown to be cost effective. It was based on that data that it be this program became one of the evidence-based programs now supported by the Administration for Community Living and also supported by CDC. So the time between then and now, we have had done a number of programs, diabetes self-management, HIV, pain, cancer, um, building better caregivers, which is a caregiver program for those with dementia. And also we have developed a number of online programs, uh, which are just corollaries. They're the same program, but they're given in a different mode. Uh, chronic disease, diabetes, cancer, and building better caregivers. So we now have a whole suite of different programs. The programs have caught on and they're really widely used. Uh, they're used in 35 countries. Thankfully, Wyoming finally decided to join us last year, so I can now say 50 states. Uh, their core components, as I said, of both ACLs and CDCs, uh, evidence-based programs for seniors. In the last couple of years, I've been fortunate enough to be working with the Pan American Health Organization and uh, disseminating the programs through Latin America. The reach is probably between 50 and 75,000 people a year. It may be greater than that. We do not have good data. Uh, one of the things we're doing is cleaning up our databases so that we can get a little bit better data. But that's 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 pretty good, and if anything, it's conservative. I didn't know this. I was lucky. But we actually did design for translation. And now I can go back and say, here's some advice to folks that want to design for translation. Choose a problem that's important. Um, if I had said, the problem I'm trying to do is, is enhance people's self-efficacy, I might have added a theory, but we wouldn't have been able to translate. Choose an intervention that can be replicated. This is incredibly important. Very, very often we have exceedingly good interventions, especially in the behavioral realm, but they're just too expensive to replicate. They're nursing one-on-one, -on -one, social worker one-on-one, -on -one, um, lots of equipment. Um, I could go on and on. You're never going to be able to translate, especially in the behavioral field, if you can't keep the thing pretty low cost. Choose outcomes that are important to policy, uh, A1C, costs, return on investment. Study populations that are representative of what you want to scale. 
And I have become fascinated with translational research. If I was starting a career all over again, I would probably do it in the field of translational research because I think we're, we have lots and lots of new methods. And I just did my first pragmatic trial. Um, they're pretty exciting stuff. And so again, those of you that are starting, think about translational research. Um, I didn't know this a year ago, but I do know it now. There's a whole literature on it, and it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. Um, and you want to be very sure that you have study instruments that are acceptable to your population and are sensitive to change. One of the things that was the problem with the SF-36 was while it was acceptable and pretty easy, it wasn't very sensitive to change. I have never used any of the new promise measures, but if I was doing this all over again, I would certainly look very, very carefully at the promise measures. And finally, how do you move from an R01 to an ROI to return on investment? In the world today, as you're doing this for translation, you kind of have to know who the competition is, who's in the same field you are, uh, how your product ranks against theirs, you want a partner, and you partner with uh, the Administration for Community Living, with the National Council for Aging, sometimes even partnering with industry. You have to be a little careful on doing that, but partnering is important. You must have a fidelity plan for the intervention. If you can't show that it's being given the same way every time, there's a problem. You gotta have a training infrastructure. Uh, we now have about 1,400 master trainers that train leaders, and we have about 100 T trainers that train master trainers worldwide. Because it's certainly sh sure that we couldn't maintain that training structure just out of Stanford. You have to have a business plan. Whether you're in a university or not in a university, you have to figure out what this translation is going to cost and how you're going to pay for it. You have to look at the labor force, and finally, you have to have the community buy-in. If the community is not like your product, it's never going to go anywhere. And the community is both the end users and also those that are going to administer the program on the local level. So that's a real romp. It's been quite a ride. And I would be delighted to answer anything anybody would like to ask me. Thank you. <laughs>